Hey, I hope you've been following this series from the beginning. We're in part six now of exploring Isaiah chapters 40 through 55 in preparation for our Gospel of Mark studies that will pull heavily from these chapters of Isaiah to explain and undergird the ministry of Yeshua, or you may call him Jesus, the Messiah. Isaiah isn't easy to understand. It's very complex historically. It's very easily taken out of context with cherry-picked verses by anti-missionaries who want to undermine faith in the Savior. But uh, we've been going through it verse by verse, taking into consideration the literary, historical, contextual, the different voices speaking, all that jazz, in order to strip away the mystery of what Yahweh is saying through his prophet to the exiles in Babylon about their imminent freedom. Yahweh's fighting the mindsets of the grandchildren of those who were exiled for their gross idolatry, who were brought up in Babylon and know no other life, who, you know, have been living as a conquered people and who have been told by the world around them that they were conquered only because their God was conquered and that they will never go back to the land because historically no nation has ever returned from exile. They are so deeply enmeshed in this polytheistic worldview that it has become their worldview. And especially since um, their parents and grandparents were henotheists before the exile, not monotheist. As we see from the scriptures, Israel never exclusively worshipped Yahweh until after the exile was over. Before then, he might have been at the top of their worship pile, but he was still one among many gods in direct violation of the first and the second commandments. Now, much of what we've covered so far has been Yahweh publicly challenging the nations and their gods in order to show that any other so-called gods are powerless and actually non-existent. It's played out with courtroom language, um, with a summons to court, presentation of evidence and witnesses and several idle polemics delivered by the prophet in order to show how utterly illogical idolatry truly is. The end message is there is no hope for Israel apart from Yahweh, and he is promising to deliver them, and no one will get in his way because no one can. So, hi, I'm Tyler Don Rosenquist, and welcome to Character in Context, where I teach the historical and ancient sociological context of Scripture with an eye to, ve to developing the character of Messiah. If you prefer written material, I have five years' worth of blog over at theancientbridge.com, plus transcripts of past broadcasts. Um as well as my six books available on Amazon, including a four-volume curriculum series dedicated to teaching scriptural context in a way that even kids can understand it. So I called it Context for Kids. And I have two video channels on YouTube with free Bible teachings for both adults and kids. You can find the link for those on my website, and past broadcasts of this program can be found at characterincontext.podbean.com. And transcripts can be had for most broadcasts at theancientbridge.com, as I said before. All right. All scripture this week is taken from the English Standard Version, the ESV, because, like I was, <laughs> that's the version my interlinear is in. And this, Isaiah is more important than most to have a good interlinear, unless you can read Hebrew fluently and you've got the Hebrew open in front of you. And that is not me, okay? Uh, unlike my usual uh, way of doing things, I will be saying Yahweh instead of God and Lord because there are so many different voices going back and forth in Isaiah chapters 40 through 55 that it really helps to eliminate the confusion. Because otherwise you're going, and you're going he and he and he. <laughs> otherwise, you know, I, I generally usually use titles because personally I, I don't want to use his name carelessly or casually. And that's just me. Okay. Now, last week we started with a but now, which forced us to backtrack into chapter 42, and we have the exact same thing this week. So we're going to have to backtrack in chapter 43 briefly. 
Remember that no therefore, or but now, or yet, or any conjunction exists on its own and has to be evaluated within the context of what went directly before. Chapters are pesky, but they're really necessary. You know, but we can't be bound by them in our studies. We can't even just study one chapter without taking what went before it and often what comes after it into context. And today is going to be heavy into simply reading the scripture. We're also going to delve into Jeremiah 10 and also Habakkuk 2 because they tie in directly with uh, Isaiah 44. Plus, I'm going to read from the Babylonian era epic or what we have of it because it's damaged. Okay, so going back into chapter 43, let's start with verse 26. And please forgive my snuffiness. It's winter. What can I say? Verse 26, put me in remembrance. Let us argue together. Set forth your case that you may be proved right. It sounds like Job, doesn't it? Well, for good reason. You go on verse 27, your first father sinned and your mediators transgressed against me. Therefore, I will profane the princes of the sanctuary and deliver Jacob to utter destruction and Israel to reviling. To review, Israel in this mock court case has been telling Yahweh that they have been wronged, that he's blind to their cause and deaf to their complaints. And they haven't accepted that their exile was their own fault. But right here, Yahweh flat out tells them that the entire nation, even back to Abraham and Moses and Aaron, have been sinning against him from the start in big and small ways and have only themselves to blame. You know, that should chill anyone to the bone. And yet, you know, we're going to have another turnaround here. Their sin in God's wrath isn't the end of the story. Never is. Let's move on into chapter 44. Um, starting in verse one, but now, but now that's why we went back. But now here, O Jacob, my servant, Israel, whom I have chosen. This is really intimate language here. My servant, Israel, whom I have chosen. What are they chosen for? As Yahweh has said repeatedly, they were chosen for his sake to be the witnesses of his mighty works and his glory, his faithfulness, grace, and power that he is unique and the gods of the nations are fictional. He says here, all right, and what does he want them to hear? Verse two, thus says the Lord who made you, who formed you from the womb and will help you. Fear not, O Jacob, my servant, Jeshurun, whom I have chosen. I'm going to talk about this word Jeshurun really quick. It is a mystery word. Nobody knows for sure what it means. Now, it shows up, I believe, in Deuteronomy. I think it only shows up two or three places in Scripture. This is one place. Deuteronomy is another. Oh, my gosh. I'm going to sneeze. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> if I sneeze, just ignore it. But um, what does it mean? We don't know. Um, you've got the the Yod and the, the, the Shin and the uh the Raish. so is this um a, a take on yasher which um is a is a word about righteousness you know you hear about safer hayasher the book of the righteous um is that or, or really upright the book of the upright Maybe. We don't know. It's this mystery word that they knew what it meant way back when, and we just kind of go, it's a head scratcher, okay? So when you see this Jeshurun, if you don't know what it means, you're in great company. Nobody alive today knows what it means. So anyway, back to the verse. Fear not. It says, fear not, O Jacob, my servant. Now, what have we learned? That means in Isianic poetry, it's a salvation oracle. Let's look at his promises of deliverance. Verse 3. For I will pour water on the thirsty land and streams on the dry ground. I will pour my spirit upon your offspring and my blessings upon your descendants. 
Now, we've only talked briefly about parallelisms. It's kind of hard to explain over, you know, over a broadcast, and I wish I had, like, charts and I could point to things for you. But here we have two parallelisms that are themselves in parallel. And um, remember that a parallelism is when you have two phrases saying the exact same thing with different wording. When it says, for I will pour water on the, on the thirsty land and streams on the dry ground, um, that's really saying the same thing. Pour water on the thirsty land is the same thing as, as streams on the dry ground. All right. And then in the next one, we've got, I will pour my spirit on your offspring and my blessing on your descendants. So it's two ways of saying the exact same thing. So, so he's saying he will pour out water on the thirsty land and pour out water on the dry ground. And he immediately follows it up with another parallelism equating the pouring out of my spirit on your offspring and my blessing on your descendants. So we've got two, two times in this verse here, it's talking about pouring out, pouring out water, pouring out streams, pouring out spirit, pouring out blessing. It means this is all linked up. This is all the same thing. Spirit, therefore, is equated with blessing. And offspring is obviously the same as descendants. But wait, there's more. The two parallelisms also parallel one another and give us the key to understanding some of the verses in past chapters about pouring out water in the desert. Remember, we had all these verses about pouring out water in the desert. And yes, it's a picture back to the Exodus out of Israel, but it's not something that happened in the return from Babylon to the land. So what was it talking about? Well, here we have the key. That's why, you know, we have to study everything. And we can't just study little parts or we won't understand the big picture. So the pouring out of water is equated with the outpouring of his spirit. But hold on. Not only did they not pour out water in the desert on the return from Babylon, but his spirit wasn't poured out either. <gasps> at least not during the return from Babylon, but Yahweh has spoken it, and so it must happen. When did it end up happening? At Shavuot, or Pentecost, after the resurrection, when the Holy Spirit was poured out on the Jewish believers in Yeshua who were gathered at the temple to pray. We see this, of course, in Acts 2. If this was referring to the exiles, it would not say your descendants. It would say you. This is a future prophecy. Okay, it's easy to miss that. That's why I always tell people, um, look for the audience. Always look for the audience. Look at who is being spoken to and, and figure out what, how that changes the message from oftentimes what we assume Anyway, okay, but for now, okay, as for now, with these exiles who are in Babylon, the exiles are still themselves dry ground spiritually, which we see in painful detail in the writings of uh, Nehemiah, Ezra, and Malachi. They need the empowerment of the spirit to truly change but that's not going to be happening anytime soon. So, verse 4 and 5. They shall spring up among the grass like willows by flowing streams. This one will say, this is important, I am the Lord's. Another will call on the name of Jacob. And another will write on his hand the Lord's and name himself by the name of Israel. Now, these verses really solidify for me that this is something that didn't happen until the time of Messiah, Yeshua. You may call him Jesus. We, we have people here, obviously not native-born Israelites, claiming that they belong to the Lord, calling on the name of Jacob, writing the Lord's name on his hand, which... Um, 
in the ancient world was a mark of servitude. All right. Um, they would off they would tattoo. They would get tattooed uh, to denote you know who owned them. Okay. And naming um, and also naming himself by the name of Israel. These are not things that any native born would need to do. No one would name themselves by the name of Israel. Okay? Because if you were born, you wouldn't need to name yourself. Okay? This is clearly, I believe, speaking of the ingrafting of Gentiles who freely choose to become part of Israel through belief in and association with the Messiah of Israel. Notice that these are all acts of individuals, not of a nation as a whole. And that is a real turning point, okay? When we, when we look at, um, when we look through the scriptures, things are pretty much, oh, jeez, I'm going to sneeze. Things are pretty much, you know, the whole nation sinks or swims together. You don't see individuals making choices. Everything is community, but this is weird. This is talking about individuals coming in and calling themselves, associating themselves, naming themselves through association with them, with the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. All right? Make sense? Hope so. If not... I have no idea because I can't see you nodding or shaking your head or scrunching your forehead at me. Okay. Verse 6. Thus says the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts. I am the, <clears throat> I am the first and I am the last. Besides me, there is no God. Who is like me? Let him proclaim it. Let him declare and set it before me. Since I appointed an ancient people, let them declare what is to come. Let, or it's, let them declare what is to come and what will happen. Fear not, nor be afraid. Have I not told you from of old and declared it? And you are my witnesses. Is there any God beside me? There is no rock. I know not any. So last week we talked about regnal names, kingly titles. Um, you know, we see them in scripture, Emmanuel, Almighty God, um, Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, it, all of these, they're, they're regnal names. Here we have, um, so it's not a literal name, it's not a literal name, but it's, it's titles. Now, here we have Yahweh, his personal name, um, Melech Yisrael, uh, which means the king of Israel, which um, proclaims the allegiance they owe to him. We've got Redeemer. This is more intimate. As the Goal was close kin who would save a person from distress. We have Lord of Hosts, which translates to Yahweh Tzvaot, uh, Yahweh of armies, proclaiming his might and his ability to save. Of course, we've seen this proclamation over and over again. I am the first and the last. Besides me, there is no God. And, and the specific word is Elohim here, a generic term meaning mighty one, and often refers in, context, in contrast to the... Uh, To the gods of the nations as it does here excuse me i'm <laughs> trying to pick something up here um again first and last is a reference to the ancient law of continuity where polytheistic gods do not exist apart from the system they are part of creation not above it and beyond it they are not like yahweh who exists outside of time and space because he created time and space if the universe and time all dissolved in all of us and everything, Yahweh would still exist because he is first and last. He alone can exist apart from all that he has created. Pagans saw their gods as part of creation, dependent on it, working in cooperation with it and needing it even because um, they needed to be fed. 
all right? And they needed humans to take care of them. Excuse me. They were trapped by the confines of space and time and history just like humans were. So when Yahweh says, who is like me? He is literally pointing all this out. No one claims to have a God that is anything like Yahweh in the ancient world. He's utterly foreign to their way of thinking. That is what it means to be first and last. And he has been communicating this to his people from the beginning. They can witness that it is true. That is why they've created in the first place. Now, okay, this is a funny story here. All right. In the Septuagint, which is the third century Greek translation of the Hebrew scriptures, they didn't include the last bit. There is no rock. I know not any. And the reason why they didn't include it is because they'd already become, they'd already begun becoming very sensitive to how Yahweh was portrayed in the Bible. And they didn't like comparing him to a rock, even if it was in his own words. Isn't that wild? Now, the next bit I'm going to read is just, I'm just going to read it straight through with only a few notes, and then I'm going to read Jeremiah 10, 1 through 16, and not simply the first four verses that are generally taken out of context, and Habakkuk 2. We're going to talk about how they're very similar and how well they line up with the section of the Era Epic, which describes in detail how the idol excuse me, of Marduk and Babylon was manufactured. Okay. Uh, hopefully I won't go over here. I'm coming close to the... Uh, so we'll just start. Starting in verse 9, All who fashion idols are nothing, and the things they delight in do not profit. Their witnesses, meaning um, the worshippers of the gods, their witnesses neither see nor know that they may put that they may be put to shame. Remember, the Psalm 115 curse on those who worship false gods is that they would be blind and deaf, just like their gods. Back to it. Who fashions a god or casts an idol that is profitable for nothing? Behold, all his companions are shall be put to shame. And the craftsmen are only human. So, they are created. Okay, they're not the creator. So it's saying the, the ones who, who forms these gods are only human. All right? Let them all assemble. Back to the verses here. Let them all assemble. Let them stand forth. They shall be terrified. They shall be put to shame together. Do you remember, what was it when we did Isaiah 41? Was it, and... Um, Yahweh makes his proclamations, and they, the nations all get scared, and they go and make gods. Well, here we go. Verse 12. The ironsmith takes a cutting tool and works it over the coals. He fashions it with hammers, and he works it with a strong arm. He becomes hungry, and his strength fails. And he drinks no water, and is faint. And this, of course, is my, my commentary. Because he's only human. Okay? This is all contrasting humans with God and um, false gods with God. So everybody's being contrasted with Yahweh here. 13. The carpenter stretches a line. He marks it out with a pencil. He shapes it with planes and marks it with a compass. He shapes it into the figure of a man with the beauty of a man to dwell in a house. He cuts down, and of course, the, the ancient word for temple was actually house, right? He cuts down cedars, or he chooses a cypress tree, or an oak, and lets it grow strong among the trees of the forest. He plants a cedar, and the rain nourishes it. Then it becomes fuel for a man. He takes part of it and warms himself. He kindles a fire and bakes bread. Also, he makes a god and worships it. He makes it an idol and falls down before it. Half of it he burns in the fire. Over the half he eats meat, he roasts and is satisfied. Also he worms himself and says, Aha, I am warm, I have seen the fire. And the rest of it he makes into a god, his idol, and falls down to it and worships it. He prays to it and says, Deliver me, for you are my god. The irony 
he is uh I mean he's worshiping and depending on something he couldn't e that it couldn't even create itself. We'll uh be right back to uh cover the rest in just a few minutes here. Hey, I'm Tyler Don Rosenquist and welcome back to Character in Context. Uh this week is Isaiah and the Messiah, part 6 and we are covering most of Isaiah 44 but we're going to cut off before we get to um the sections in 44 and 45 that are just entirely about King Cyrus, because in order to do that, we're going to have to do a history lesson on King Cyrus, Cyrus the Great. But this week we are covering the, I believe it's the longest, yeah, the longest uh, idol polemic in scripture. And in order to explore that, we're covering not only this one in Isaiah 44, but we're also going to cover... Jeremiah 10 verses 1 through 16 and Habakkuk 2 because they all um, are talking about the exact same thing and understanding one helps in understanding the other because it was a very real reality, real reality as opposed to a fake reality. <clears throat> in the ancient world, this uh, idea that you could build an idol to um, and really perform a ritual on it and it will be inhabited by the essence of a god that you can then serve and manipulate and, and all that stuff. So, But we had just left off with uh, verse 17 of Isaiah 44. And uh, I'll just read that again. Because it's been talking about how he's taken this wood and he's done all these things with it. And one of the things, he's roasted his meat, he's gotten warm by the fire. And... He also made a god, and he bows down to it, something, you know, he's worshipping and depending upon something that couldn't even create itself. Something that uh, really depends on the idol maker for survival, and just the, uh, the irony of that, considering the fact that Yahweh didn't need anyone to make him. That's why he keeps saying, I'm the only one here. There aren't these other gods that um, of Babylon that the Babylonians are telling you defeated me because that's been what's been going on since Isaiah 40. They do, they're non-existent. I'm the only one. They're all just big losers and fakers and, and all that stuff. Okay, so back to it. Uh, verse 18. <clears throat> they know not, nor they do they discern. So he's talking about the, um, the idol worshippers, <clears throat> the idol makers. They know not, nor do they discern, for he has shut their eyes, so they cannot see, and their hearts, so they cannot understand. Of course, this is Psalm 115, all over again, where uh, those who worship idols are doomed to become just like them, blind and deaf. Um, and I talk about this a lot in, um, which one is it? It's, it's my last book. It's uh, I, Identity, Idolatry, and the New Creation in the Bible. So I talk about that more there. Let's see, verse 19, no one considers, nor is there knowledge or discernment to say, half of it I burned in the fire, and I also baked bread on its coals, I roasted meat and have eaten, and shall I make the rest of it into an abomination? Shall I fall down before a block of wood? So really, it's like when you put it that way, yeah, it sounds ridiculous, Isaiah. Verse 20, he feeds on ashes, because that's what was done with the rest of the same exact piece of wood that he made a god of. Um, a deluded heart has led him astray, and he cannot deliver himself or say, Is there not a lie in my right hand? And that right hand, of course, is the hand that you extend in friendship. To have anything in your right hand, it's, it's, it's acceptance, it's friendship. So, yeah... Ah, now Yahweh, it, it says in, in scripture that Yahweh is holding on to Israel's right hand. Um, well, idolor, idolaters are holding idols in their right hand. And of course, so has um, Israel been all this time. The, uh, <coughs> excuse me, the, um, the contrast is very stark and very deliberate. And, okay. It looks silly to us because, you know, we get it now, how ridiculous this is. 
But to a polytheist, it was not so obvious. It was the context of their whole life, and it's still the context of large, of a large percentage of this world where they still do practice Id idolatry, idol worship, especially in places like India. Okay, um, but it was this was the context of their whole life, making idols and using them to placate, mollify, serve, and manipulate their gods. Now, I want to read from Jeremiah 10, and not just the four verses used out of context that people use in their zeal to discredit Christmas trees, which I don't like either, but I'm not going to use scripture out of context in the pursuit of an agenda. We've got to find another way, okay? I'm going to read... All of the verses, uh, 1 through 16, and especially the ones that make it clear that this is referring to actual idols to whom people would go to seek wisdom and counsel and, and help from. Jeremiah 10, starting in verse 1. Hear the word that the Lord speaks to you, O house of Israel. And this was written before they went into exile, all right? Thus says the Lord. Learn not the way of the nations, nor be dismayed at the signs of the heavens, because the nations are dismayed at them. For the customs of the peoples are vanity. A tree from the forest is cut down and worked with an axe by the hands of a craftsman. They decorate it with silver and gold. They fasten it with hammer and nails so it cannot move. And here is where people stop quoting, because from now on it's going to be obvious they're talking about actually a carved idol. Uh, verse 5, their idols are like scarecrows in a cucumber field, and they cannot speak. They have to be carried, for they cannot walk. Do not be afraid of them, for they cannot do evil, neither is it in them to do good. Now, no one would suggest that anyone would think it necessary to point out that a Christmas tree can't walk or talk or do good or do evil. They're compared to scarecrows for a reason, because they have been carved into the shape of a human being. But people stop quoting this section once they get to the end of verse, or to the beginning of verse 5, because the context becomes clear. And, you know, this language should sound familiar if you've uh, listened to the whole series with Yahweh making demands that the gods of the nations need to do something, anything, good or bad, to prove that they are real. And, of course, the response is the same every time. Silence. They can't do anything to prove they're real. Verse 6 of Jeremiah 10. There is none like you, O Lord. You are great, and your name is great in might. Who would not fear you, O king of the nations? For this is your due. For among all of the wise ones and all the nations and in all of the kingdoms, there is none like you. They are both stupid and foolish. The instruction of the idols is but wood. Again, no one seeking counsel from a Christmas tree. Verse 9, beaten silver is brought from Tarshish and gold from Uphaz. So beaten silver is important. They are the work of the craftsmen and of the hands of the goldsmith. Their clothing is violet and purple, and they're all the work of skillful men. It's talking about literal clothing. As we talked about in uh, part two of Isaiah and the Messiah, we talked about ancient idolatry and how idols were made and, and the fact that they, they lived in houses and they were dressed and they were bathed and put to bed and fed and, and all that stuff, treated like kings. Verse 10, but the Lord is the true God. He is the living God and the everlasting king. At his wrath, the earthquakes and the nations cannot endure his indignation. Now, the big national idols were carved from sacred wood and covered from head to toe with beaten sheets of gold and silver and dressed like kings and queens. We covered that before. Verse 11. Thus you shall say to them, The gods who did not make the heavens and the earth shall perish from the earth and from under the heavens. It is he who made the earth by his power, who established the world by his wisdom, and by his understanding stretched out the heavens. He, when he utters his voice, there is a tumult of waters in the heavens, and he makes the mist rise from the ends of the earth. He makes lightning for the rain, and he brings forth wind from his storehouses. Every man is stupid and without knowledge. Every goldsmith is put to shame by his idols. Okay, back to the context. We are talking about idols here. For his images are false, and there is no breath in them. I mean, that would be ridiculous to say about a Christmas tree. 
They are worthless, a work of delusion. At the time of their punishment, they shall perish. And that is at the time of the idol maker's punishment, the idol shall perish. That's what this is talking about. Not like this, all the hymns and he's, right? It's, it, it's hard. Not like these is he who is the portion of Jacob, for he is the one who formed all things. Yahweh's, Jeremiah's talking about Yahweh here. And Israel is the tribe of his inheritance. The Lord of hosts is his name. Okay, let's look at Habakkuk 2, verses 18 and 19. It's a real short se section, but it's, it's useful. When its maker has shaped it, a metal image, a teacher of lies... For its maker trusts in his own creation when he makes speechless idols. Woe to him who says to a wooden thing, Awake! To silent stone, Arise! Can this teach? Behold, it is overlaid with gold and silver, and there is no breath at all in it. Now, we're going to compare this to the era epic. Um, it's the uh, one of Babylonian creation stories, okay? Tablet 1 contains the following imprints. Um, they are a bit damaged. You know, sometimes they were, they were put on cuneiform tablets. And if it gets dented, that, that's kind of it. For, uh, oh, let's see. In context, Ezra, the warrior god, or Era, Ezra. Era, the warrior god, is challenging Marduk, the king of the gods, because the idol of Marduk's temple, the idol in Marduk's temple, has lost its luster. Marduk explains that he left his dwelling when he caused the great flood. All right, so here's Marduk speaking. As to my precious image, you know, it's because Era has, has challenged him and, and he's shaming Marduk is what he's doing. As to my precious image, his idol, which has been struck by the deluge that its appearance was sullied, I commanded fire to make my features shine. Because it's overlaid with gold. That's that's not in there. That's I put that in there. And to cleanse my apparel, because obviously it's wearing clothing. Okay. When it had shined, when the fire had shined, my precious image and completed the task, I donned my lordly diadem and returned. Okay. When his idol looks idol looks suitable again, he returned his essence to it. Um. And it's, it has a crown on it, okay? Diadem. I sent those craftsmen down to the depths, and I ordered them not to come up. I removed the wood and gemstone and showed no one where, and it's damaged at this point, where is the wood, flesh of the gods, suitable for the king of the universe, the lord of the universe? And uh, every culture that I've come across seemed to believe that certain kinds of wood were suitable to be the flesh of an idol. In this case, the wood is from the mesu tree, whatever that is. Okay, back to it. The sacred tree, sacred or splendid stripling, perfect for lordship, whose roots thrust down a hundred leagues through the waters to, of the vast ocean to the depths of hell, whose crown brushed Anu's heaven on high. Where is the gemstone that I reserved for... Then that word is damaged. Where is... Oh, brother. Ninildum. Hey, I did it. Great carpenter of my supreme divinity. Not some. That's the idol maker. The wielder of the glittering hatchet. Who knows what tool. Although, you know, we would think of the hatchet only in the hands of a lumberjack. In this case, the hatchet is the tool of a craftsman. Hatchets are way smaller than axes, and, and oftentimes in ancient languages they had one word for tool, and context determines which one is being referenced. And we would have to, when we look in Isaiah, Isaiah talks about the different tools and the different kinds of um, um, workers. Okay. Who makes it shine like the day and puts it at subjection to my feet? And we've got some damage parts. Where are the choice stones created by the vast sea to ornament my diadem? That's a crown. And the big city gods were crowned with real crowns just as they were dressed with real clothing. All right, so that's the era epic. And I mean, that's just like, that sounds very similar to what we see in Isaiah and um, Jeremiah and Habakkuk. They're all talking about the same thing. They're talking about an idol maker making 
a big city god. All right? The ones that are covered with um, beaten, beaten precious metals and gems and clothing <clears throat> and placed in a temple. Okay, now I'm going to include a quote from Trevor Bryce's excellent work, Life and Society in the Hittite World. This is on page 157. He writes, in the latter part of the New Kingdom, the statues of the gods were set up on bases in the sanctuary of their temples, and they were life-size or larger. Okay, they were made of precious and semi-precious metals, gold, silver, iron, bronze, or... Um, or else of wood um, plated with gold, silver, or tin, and sometimes decorated with precious stones like lapis lazuli. You know, we've got, we have um, actual information on the statuette of the goddess Iaia, and uh, here's a quote, the divine image is a female statuette of wood, seated and veiled, one cubit in height, so that's one cubit is about a foot and a half, normally. Her body is plated with gold, but the body and the throne are plated with tin. So that was Trevor Bryce, and he's a great scholar of the ancient world. So we see a lot of similarities between the era epic, which is taking this project absolutely seriously and the bible which absolutely is not taking idol making seriously but both are describing the exact same phenomenon the creation of an idol out of sacred wood covered with hammered precious metals clothed in the finest fabrics ornamented with precious gemstones and polished until it shines etc etc and i mean this was this was how you honored your gods by making as lavish and wonderful a body for it as you could and treating it like you would um, kings, okay? Now, I understand that a lot of people hate Christmas trees and want to discredit them, but that isn't what this is about. It just isn't. And I think that people, the people who originally taught this knew it because I don't see any other reason for ignoring most of the text and the other prophetic package, passages that go along with it. Also, in the ancient world, a dead tree wasn't a symbol of fertility. That's what sacred groves were for. When good kings came to power, they cut down the sacred groves, not to bring the trees inside, but to burn them outside the city gates in order to defile them. First rule of sacred tree club is don't cut down the sacred tree, or it isn't sacred anymore. It's been defiled. A dead tree isn't a fertility symbol unless you carved it into an Asherah or one of the other fertility goddesses. Through Assyrian and Babylonian and Egyptian art, what we do see are carved representations of people around trees with what look to the untrained eyes like to be like boxes and ornaments, and some ministries have colorized these to enhance the effect. But these are all just rock. They, there's no color to them. But I've seen one of these up close at the St. Louis Museum, and I have verified what ancient Near Eastern scholars and archaeologists say. They are people using pine cones, and you can see that it is a pine cone from up close because it has the little ridges, okay? Ridges. What do you, what do you call them? Um, to pollinate, so they've got these pine cones to pollinate the tree of life, because the tree of life, you find it in every culture. And the boxes are actually baskets they are filling with the fruit of the tree of life, which is wisdom. We know this because we have cuneiform tablets and other writings of mythologies giving testimony to this throughout the ancient world. If you want to be, a go if you want to be against Christmas trees, we can point out the waste of resources involved and the gross commercialism of the holiday in general and the terrible debt racked up that... that cannot be said to be done in the name of Messiah. But Christmas trees really aren't more than, you know, several hundred years old, and, and they're Germanic, not ancient Near Eastern. Let's not use the Bible out of context in order to serve agendas. It's dangerous business, and I believe disrespectful to the precious word we've been gifted with. We can't criticize people for saying that's not what it means to me, and then turn around and do it ourselves. Okay. 
lecture over. Let's go back to the text. Verse 21 of Isaiah 44. Remember these things, O Jacob and Israel, for you are my servant. I formed you. You are my servant, O Israel. You will not be forgotten by me. Now, remember these things? Well, the language isn't entirely clear, so we have a couple of choices. Either one, he's telling them not to forget how ridiculous idols are. I'm not really extremely fond of that option. Or two, all these deliverances of the past, he has been reminding them of, maybe that's it. Or three, what he tells them in his next breath. Namely, you are my servant, I formed you. Then he repeats, you are my servant, and then you will not be forgotten by me. I think this is the right option because he tells them to remember and then he says they will not be forgotten. There's a definite chiastic structure here, which I can't explain on the radio. I need charts and I would prefer to have a chart, but oh well. So what is the result of not being forgotten by Yahweh? Verse 22, I have blotted out your transgressions like a cloud and your sins like mist. Return to me for I have redeemed you. Okay, I have blotted out your transgressions. Remember that is Pesha, willful and rebellious high-handed offenses that are not covered by the sacrifices. The word translated as blotted out can also be translated swept away, which makes more sense when the process is being compared to dispersing a cloud. We also see included in this that the Hatat sins, the unintentional sins, being swept away with like a mist. So we have Yahweh forgiving not only the greatest of their offenses, but also the least. This is total and complete forgiveness. Again, we keep coming across this radical grace that is being extended to the exiles who certainly aren't repentant before him, and most of them won't even end up leaving exile. They will choose to stay. And those who do go back, a lot of these guys marry pagan women. Although we don't see them engaging in idol worship again, Malachi has them doing plenty of other horrible things. And yet God extends this amazing grace to them and forgives it all for his own sake, which he says repeatedly. Not because they are deserving, but because he created them to be his witnesses, and unless he wipes the slate clean, he's not going to have any witnesses. He says, return to me, for I have redeemed you. Again, Speaking of the future as though it's already a done deal. Although they cannot see their redemption, it is absolutely real. He's calling on them to acknowledge the reality of his salvation before they can even see it. While they're still wallowing in denial as to their culpability in this whole terrible mess. And, you know, we just aren't that much different today, are we? <laughs> So often when something terrible happens to us, we blame it on Satan or on other people being jerks when... Really, it's often just the natural consequences of our own insufferable actions. We behave boorishly in real life on so or on social media, and they exile us from their wall by unfriending or blocking us, and we go back to our walls and say, they just can't handle the truth. Well, more than likely, they can't handle our incessant caterwauling. No one wants to be preached at all the time in their own cyber living room, and especially not by people who really don't know as much as they think they do and aren't as mature as they think they are. If we exhaust people, they are going to preserve their peace by giving us the boot. Nothing mysterious or mean-spirited, and not necessarily an aversion to the truth, just an aversion to us. Well, that's how the Israelites were treating Yahweh. They were sitting in a well-deserved exile, and first they called Yahweh blind and deaf to their rights, and then they feigned complete ignorance as to having earned the exile, blaming it on his incompetence instead, and they didn't worship him in exile as they should have, but heaped up their sins in his face, and yet he forgives because he's nicer, more patient, more everything good and grace-filled than we are. He is the God who remembers. He is the God who forgives. He is just unreal. And nothing human compares to him except for, of course, Yeshua the Messiah, Jesus the Christ. Anyway, so um, next week we're either going to talk about Cyrus or, because that's what's coming up next, we're going to do a mini history lesson, which will be important to understanding the context, or I'm going to talk about Hanukkah. I haven't decided yet. It, 
it just all depends how my my conference preparations goes i'm going to be um for Hanukkah, I'm going to be in North Carolina speaking at a Founded in Truth uh, conference. I hope we're going to see you there. It, it should be a great time, and I am looking forward to seeing my friends again. It's been a few years. And uh, anyway, I hope you learned a lot uh, this week, and uh, I'll see you next week. Bye.